they continue to work their way through the Acts of the Apostles and come into chapter 6. This morning, God willing, we're going to consider the first seven verses of chapter 6. I've given a title to it of Moving Forward. We've been reading about the early church and how she flourishes. It wasn't without trouble. It wasn't without difficulty. The trouble that they'd been having with the religious establishment is well recorded. They wanted to shut them down, stop them speaking. But by God's grace, they stand firm and the church flourishes and grows. But some troubles came from outside the church. Sorry, from inside the church. In the form of Ananias and Sapphira. Who would have believed that Christians could be so deceitful? And God had acted very suddenly to deal with that. There is no place for deceit in the kingdom of God. But this morning we're going to look at a, another trouble that comes. It's encouraging to, to, to see that the early church had as many troubles as we do. And I believe these troubles are recorded so that you and I might learn to set our priorities. So that we, like they, might move forward with the gospel. So in the passage that's before us this morning, there's a problem that needs to be solved. There's a priority that needs to be established. And there's the joy and delight of seeing the, the progress steadily go on with the Gospel Church. I think when you and I are willing to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and be instructed by his words, we will also see the Church make progress in our generation. Let me take you then, first of all, to the problem that needed to be solved. Verses 1 through to 6 of the chapter, it's actually the, the largest part of the chapter, but I, I think one of the dangers is that we dwell too much time on the problem. We need to see how it was dealt with and what priority was set in the midst of it. There's a problem in the church. The church is being too successful. Now that's not something we know an awful lot about nowadays. But the church is growing so fast that they can't keep up with the practical things that need to be done to look after the people. It's not the people who are the problem. It's the fact that whenever you get a large group of people together, and some would have us think of the church having grown to around 20,000 people by this time, if you follow the different accounts of how many were saved, the last one says there was 5,000 men saved, that would then have a parallel number of women and there would be children, and by this time the gospel has continued to see men and women converted, and so there would be an enormous number of people. And the challenge then is how to cope with their needs, one need in particular, caring for those who were widows and had no income of their own. But I want to highlight it to you this morning because the real challenge that was going on here was that the church might be diverted from its main course. And historically that has happened to Christianity. In fact, a lot of modern Christianity is off course. What they're concerned about is caring for the material needs of men and women. Now it's right to care for the material needs. But the danger is this, that takes up all our time and energy. But as I'll show you in a few minutes, the apostles were very wisely equipped to point out that the real business of the church is to cry, Behold the Lamb. It's to preach the gospel, it's to tell the word. But let's take a few minutes just to see how that works out in this passage. The gospel, you see, is a message for people. And when you get people converted, they don't come in nice, comfortable packages. They don't come so that they fit in and have no problems. Wherever you have people, there are problems. Even the, the, the ones that are materially wealthy or, or well off will find that their health fails them, that their circumstances uh, twist their life inside out and upside down. And in the early church, one of those problems was in fact the need to take care of the widows. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, 
there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. You can just imagine it, can't you? The Hebrews and the Hellenists. And it's about widows. Everybody knows that the Bible it tells us about God's great concern for widows. And all those who like them are without the means for normal life, as we would suggest it. One of my books said, as widows were often overlooked by men, God has a particular concern for them. The Lord watches over the strangers. Psalm 146, verse 9. He relieves the fatherless and widow, but, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. You see, God, and I could have used lots of Old Testament passages to, to illustrate this, has this special concern for those who are needy. The Lord Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. The principle is set in the New Testament that we are to care for those who are in need. James sums it up, chapter 1, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted against the world. There is without any doubt a principle in Scripture that God's people are to care for those among them who are in need and that that care is also to be extended to others who are not part of their congregation. We are to have a, a heart like God and look upon the troubled world around us with compassion. Now in the early church that had obviously been a part of their life. Acts chapter 2 verse 44. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. It wasn't communism. It was a system whereby they would look around and see who was in need and those who had the means would say, I'll help. But again, as the church grows, as different kinds of people are brought in, you get this conflict that often happens, Hebrews and Hellenists. They're from different cultural groups and one's looking at the other and saying, we're not being treated fairly. Our widows are being neglected. Who were they? Hebrews would be people who were native Jews and had been, who had grown up and lived all their lives in Palestine. They were Jewish through and through and now the gospel has made them Christian. Hellenists were also Jews. But they were different in this. Historically what happened in Judaism was the Jews moved throughout the whole of the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire before it. And they were affected by the culture of the country to which they moved. And a Hellenist is a Jew who has been affected by Greek thinking and philosophy, by Roman culture. And as this is all happening just after the, the feast of Passover and Pentecost, when they had come to Jerusalem, there are differences between them, cultural differences. And people tend to group together by their culture. I met a Scotsman in the marketplace yesterday. There's an immediate report. You know, just because he happens to come from the same culture. There's something about us, isn't there? If you meet somebody from your town, if you meet somebody from where you grew up, you have an affinity. These two groups were coexisting, but there was this grumbling problem going on in their midst. They were being neglected in the daily distribution. It would appear that up to this time, the apostles had taken responsibility for everything. And they would run off their feet. So 12, you'll see then in verse 2, summoned the multitude of disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, and we will give ourselves continually 
to prayer and the ministry of the word. What's the solution to the problem within the church? The church needs to solve it. God's people need the wisdom and grace to recognise real issues, not brush them under the carpet, and then make the effort, take the time to get it sorted out. These people are all disciples. It's an important description of Christians in the New Testament. In fact, it's the most common description. You remember the command was to go into all the world, preach the gospel and make disciples. People who had come under the discipline of Christ, because that's what a disciple is. People who knew that Jesus is not only their Saviour, but also their Lord. People who understood that the Word of God was to be that which directed their lives. But they're also brethren, according to this passage. They're common in this. They have one Heavenly Father and one Saviour. And as such, there shouldn't be falling out. There should be a, a seeking to find a way through it. And in God's mercy, the apostles make this arrangement whereby the congregation, the 20,000, it's interesting to take note of these little details, you see. The New Testament church was congregational in the way it was structured and organised. When something had to be decided, it wasn't just the apostles who said, well, that's what do we think. But it was possible they would actually talk with the people and, and consult them and seek to find a way through what lay ahead. And so they turned to the people and asked that they might themselves identify people to take the load off the apostles. <coughs> at the same time to deal with this very real and important need of caring for those who are in need. It's important to notice the qualifications. These men are not just to be any Tom, Dick or Harry. Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. They have to be publicly recognised as being godly men, full of the Holy Spirit. There are to be people who know the power of Jesus in their daily lives and wisdom. Wisdom is an important subject. I'm going to be talking about it tonight. But wisdom is really knowing how to live on earth in such a way as to please God. It's how to put your life into the light of the word and live it through. So that these are to be godly men. Many folks see here an early picture of what will le later become deacons. And when you go to the standards for deacons in Timothy and Titus, you'll immediately see the parallels. That these are to be pub publicly recognised godly people who are in fact fit and reputable and able to do that. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. I like that. That's fine. Must have been great to have gone from an unhappy church to a happy one. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Everybody saw the sense of it. And everybody liked the solution. And everybody was involved then in choosing these people who were to become important in the life of the church. There are seven of them. Two of them are further mentioned in the scripture. The other five appear to have just gone with the job. And, and there's no other record of them. Stephen, as we already read, gets himself into trouble because he wasn't just a helper, he was also a preacher. And then chapter 7 will tell us about Stephen's execution. Philip is mentioned later on in the book because he has daughters who are prophets. But the fact is, you see, these people were identified and then they were set apart. This is how you solve problems in the Church of Jesus Christ using a pattern which goes back. There's a, there's a story, isn't there, of Moses. When Moses is so overwhelmed by what he needs to do, it's his father-in-law that comes and suggests to him, listen, you're trying to do too much. And 70 are appointed to help him. It really does take wisdom at times, because when you are doing too much, it's hard at times to stop and see that you're doing too much. And it also goes back to the church, doesn't it? There needs to be people in the church who have developed these skills and abilities and who are willing to make the sacrifice. Why? Because Satan is always active. 
And a genuine grievance can soon turn into a real issue and problem in the church. There's a, a test every time something goes wrong about how you're going to handle it. You remember later Paul will talk about not letting the sun go down in your anger. But he then goes on to say you've not to give Satan a foothold. It's amazing how something which is a, a real matter of concern can be hijacked, if you want, by Satan. And truly, that's the picture of church history, is it not? How many issues should have been solved? And how many were resolved by splintering and going off at a tangent? Dear friends, look at this passage with great care and ask yourself whether in fact you recognise here a way through the troubles that so often come to us. But recognise also, you see, that a, a working church is not a one-man business. It's a, a work for the whole congregation and that within the congregation we need to be looking for those who are skilled, able and trustworthy to take responsibility. And those folks need to recognise that there's work here that needs to be done and it's probably my job to get on and do it. Again, it pops into my mind, there's a passage in the pastoral epistles where it says that anyone who desires to be an elder desires a good thing. Yeah, there should be a desire not only to point at the people who are, in, who are leading, but also to recognise that we together are the community called the church. One writer says the church is like a sailing ship designed to sail through rough seas. But the church, it says, has always been undermanned with too few workers and too little money. Christians need to serve as God has gifted them and then work anywhere in an emergency. We're not in a world where we have gaffers. And we shouldn't be in a world where we have complainers. If there's work to be done, ask the question, should I not be doing it? Your fellow Christians will guide you as to whether you're right or wrong. Now, if you're not a Christian this morning, what's this got to do with you? You see, the church is an organisation that needs people. And when God converts people, he converts them to work, to be involved. They've often developed skills in their secular world which can be used in the church. Things like working with finance, things like working with, with the paperwork of the church that needs to be uh, fulfilled and carried out. Things like looking after buildings. These are all works that need to be done. And if, if, if one man is left with all this, none of them will be done appropriately. And the church itself will be hindered. So I challenge you, if you're not a Christian, come to Christ. He'll not only save you, he'll, he'll occupy your time, your mind and your heart for the days that lie ahead. But I do need to get back to what I, I've seen here as being the priority of the church. It was really quite a challenge. If you look at verse 2 again, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Verse 4 says, We will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. This is not just that the apostles were on an evil trail. This is not just that they thought that they were too good for this other work. They had been doing it. This is so the gospel message might go out to the world, which is our priority, our first business as a church. Let the building fall to pieces. Make sure the gospel is being preached. Because it's through the preaching of the gospel that the word of God progresses. That's why I chose the last hymn, Charles Wesley's um, words in verse 5 of hymn 171. His only righteousness I show, his saving truth proclaim. Tis all my business here below to cry, behold the Lamb. Tis all my business here below.
the cry, behold the Lamb. And it occurs to me, you see, that will also happen when a church is organized and functioned as the Bible describes, then people will ask, why are you doing this? And even the people who are, who are not the preachers will have opportunity to say, all my business is to cry, behold the Lamb. I'm doing it for Jesus. I'm doing it so that you might learn about Jesus. And the church then, if you take this passage as a pattern, is to be ordered in such a way as to can't get it out, facilitate the preaching of the word. That's our main business. That's why our, our, our auditoriums are set out as they are. Because we know that God has appointed the, the, the foolishness of the message preached to be the means by which men and women are converted and to be the means by which the, the, the church is built up. It's not our business to entertain people. It's not our business to bore them either. But it's not our business to entertain people, keep them happy. It's our business, as Mr. Wesley says, to cry, Behold, behold the Lamb. Jesus' apostles are perfectly clear in that perspective. When they look at the problem, they not only see the, the crying need to care for people, they understand that they need to clear the way for the gospel to go out into the world. It is not desirable we should leave the word of God and serve tables. That phrase, serve tables, conjures up a picture of taking plates of food round. But in fact, it means more than that. It would include that. It actually takes you back to the New Testament time when most business was done across tables. You remember the Lord Jesus went into the temple and he cleared the, out the money changers by turning their tables upside down. So he's actually saying it's not our business to, to be there making sure every detail of where the money is going and how it's being used. It wouldn't be right. It would mean we would have to stop this incredible business. Remember how chapter 5 finished verse 42 and daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. That's why the widows were neglected. They were preoccupied with the gospel. Preoccupied with preaching Christ. We will give ourselves continually to prayer. It's an interesting phrase. Prayer, dear friend, is the hardest work in the world. I'd rather preach a sermon than spend an hour in prayer. It's hard work. And it's a central part of the gospel preacher's life. We will give ourselves. It means there's a sacrifice. It was Martin Luther, I think, who says... That, that when he was over busy he had to get up earlier in the morning to spend more time in prayer and yet that's the very thing which is so often sacrificed in our lives isn't it I'm so busy I didn't have time this morning partner. we will give ourselves continually to prayer seeking God's help for the gospel if it is only by grace where does grace come from is it in a bucket on the shelf? No, it's in God's hand. And God is pleased to give us as we ask. You have not, says James. Why? Because you ask not. Prayer is a fascinating subject. and almost deserves a sermon on its own. No, a whole series of sermons. Read some of the great books on prayer. They'll keep you busy for weeks. But if I can just try and boil it down, prayer is really getting yourself into that place where God can use you. Prayer is coming before God and saying, for whatever skills and abilities you've given me, none of it will work unless you make it work. Prayer is coming before God and, and not just bringing a shopping list, sometimes you will have. It's actually coming and saying, your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. And when you say on earth, that means in your life as well. That means you're going to come. And so we find here these apostles 
who had lived with Jesus, who had seen him resurrected, who had experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that they're not sort of going on what's in the tank. They need to be connected to their Heavenly Father and they need thereby to draw from him the grace and the power to go on. Now, I, I immediately apply that to the gospel ministry, you see. What does a minister do all week? I sometimes ask myself that many question. If you were to look at his timetable, you should find a substantial amount of time set apart in prayer. Now, the world looks on and says you're doing nothing. Uh-uh. You're at the very point in which you can actually begin to do something. And until you're in that quiet, quiet place with God, until you're ready and willing to understand <coughs> that, you're not ready to stand in a pulpit and preach. Even as you're preparing sermons, you're praying. It's a continual business. Now, don't elevate the preacher too high, because in actual fact, the New Testament says it's every Christian's continual business. Pray without... Can you put the next word in? Ceasing. That means it's not just when you've gone into the quiet place and shut the door. It's an attitude of life out in public, isn't it? But go back to these disciples. Those who would speak for God need to walk with God. And it's here that the church does that be. It was in John Calvin I read. He says the word continually signifies to be as it was fastened and tied to a thing. Fastened and tied. That's a lovely picture, isn't it? Prayer is not just what you fit in when there's a few minutes. It needs to be a regular part of the preacher's life and I want to argue of every Christian's life. Listen to some of these texts. Acts 1.14 These all continued, it's the same word, with one accord in prayer and supplication. Acts 2.42 And they continued, the same word, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayer. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Acts 2, 46. There was something about the early Christians which, which if you were to see them from the outside, you would say, they're always talking to God. It's one of the things that substantiates the reality of God. And God really is and really exists. He not only talks to us, he listens to us. His eye is upon us, says the psalmist. His ear is inclined towards us. Make sure that your mouth is saying something. But of course you don't have to pray audibly. It can help at times. The apostles, you see, make it clear that they are to be men who are serving God by bringing the needs of the gospel before God, pleading with him for the grace to see it flourish and work and it's happening. And they will give themselves continually to the ministry of the word. It's, to, it's important to see that if you look at the church as a business, Leslie said, what's our business here below? It's to cry, behold the lamb. I like that. But if you look at the church as a business, what is our raw material? What are we manufacturing? What are the tools given to us to manufacture it? What should be the end product? Now, I've never really thought about that much until I was studying this passage, you see. But it's really fascinating. We work with the Word of God. God uses our lives and our lips to communicate it. God takes the word by his spirit in answer to our prayers and converts other people and builds us up. It's not for observers, it's for those who are committed to the gospel. And that's most especially true of the preacher, of a man whom God has set apart and recognised as a minister of the gospel. Again, that's an important statement, you see. A minister is not the minister of a church. He is, in fact, a minister of the Word of God. The word minister, which I prefer to pastor or reverend or any other word, maybe it's just because that's what we use in Scotland, means a servant. 
It is in fact the word from which later on you'll get the word deacon. It's a servant. My life is here to serve God by passing on his word. And I hope and pray that I don't get in the way too often. Preach the word, Paul says to Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come, and we're there, this is describing today, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That's the challenge, isn't it? Are you and I passionate about making sure the word of God is preached? It's one thing to have a preacher, he needs to have a congregation. The two go together, hand in hand, don't they? He needs to have a congregation. How are we going to see our congregations built up, get into the quiet place, come before God, take his word and his promises back to him? It's a great challenge to understand that all our business here below is to cry, behold, behold, to that. To get people to look at him. To understand by looking at him that he's perfect and they're not. To understand by looking at him that he's God's provision to make them perfect and ready for heaven. To understand that he's the one who will bring righteousness ultimately to rule when he returns. Look at Jesus. Think about Jesus. He'll show you you're a sinner and he'll demonstrate God's love to you as a sinner and draw you to himself. Well, dear friends, that's our business here below. And that's what the unbeliever needs to hear. There will be times when we need to take care of their physical needs. When we need to go the extra mile to make sure they're comfortable and they have the food they need and the place to live they need but all the time it has to be done with a mind to getting them to look at Jesus I need to press on oh man time always seems to run away with me the last point is not to be overlooked verse 7 then maybe you could underline the then in the Bible I don't know what you underline in your Bibles but when I get these sort of connecting words they make me stop then notice a pattern They've seen the problem, they've recognised how to deal with it, they've seen that preaching is the main priority, the main business of the church, then the word of God spread and the number of disciples increased. Oh no, you would almost want to say, they're already having trouble handling the mob that's there. Mob, that's a bad word, the crowd that's there. Then the word, number of disciples multiplied greatly and then the next line is really important. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Here is God crowning their efforts with blessing. And here, dear friend, is where you and I should be going. We live in days when there is so little blessing that we need to look at this and say, Lord, which part are we missing? And there are still places where the word of God is faithfully preached. There are still places where, where the people of God and, and, and his leaders are spending time in prayer. Or should it not be that there should be blessing? Remember these words from Isaiah 55, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it might be <clears throat> seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. But a promise is contained in God's word, isn't it? A word of life unto life, but also a word of death unto death. The word of God spread. In the original language, it's it's a participle, if you know what that is. It's a, a word which is describing something that's happening all the time. It kept on spreading. It was like an infection. Chapter 8, the Christians are dispersed all over the world because of the persecution. And they go everywhere. The Bible says evangelizing, but it's actually gospeling. Prick a Christian and out comes the story of Christ. 
oh that it were the case in my life and yours. Let me just race on to the final bit about these priests. Just take a moment to notice. Up till this time they resisted the gospel. These were the men who served in the temple. They would have had a, a ringside seat of what was happening to Christ and his crucifixion. They were in the temple the moment he died and the curtain tore from the top to the bottom. They had seen phenomena and incredible things and yet they weren't converted. But now as the church gets its focus, as it sets its aim and goal in the preaching and teaching of the word and spending time in prayer, what happens is God changes their hearts. And these men are drawn in to the kingdom of God so that Christ is glorified in them and the gospel advances further on. Dear friends, passages like this are a real stimulus to be about the Lord's work. We desperately need to see the gospel flourish. There was a tremendous time in the marketplace yesterday one of the best we've had for a while if you talk about opportunities to speak to people and you managed to get a word with the, the curate from the parish church but you have to ask yourself what's happening to that word why is it folks are not converted, I met a man who was in the Falkland Islands and had been working as a chaplain in the Falkland Islands as well as a member of the RAF and he was involved in, in burying lots of soldiers Airmen or whatever they were. Let's see them pickering. And it's great to have a conversation, but where's the converting work? Where's the commanding work of the gospel? Dear friends, go back here and be encouraged. You and I need to see that this thing surely goes together, that this business of ours to be proclaim, behold, behold the Lamb, is a business which is supposed to have results. God until those results are actually happening. We need it in our own life as a believer. I think it's one of the things that's made us so submissive and we're accepting the things as they are. You can't read the Bible and accept what's happening at the present time as normal. You read this book and you say, Lord, that's how it should be. Please make it so. I pray that that will be your prayer as you go through the rest of this day and into the week. Ask God that what you've heard in the preaching of the word might work effectively in your life and be ready then to allow it to move from you to another individual that they might come into the good and the benefit of it. Time means I need to stop. May God bless these words to all our souls and encourage us to expect great things from God as William Carey said and attempt great things for God.